All right. G'day, everyone. You guys ready? One, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're doing a little informal sort of discussion about all Helix-related things. I'm going to get the guys to introduce themselves and explain the awesome projects that they come from, starting with Corey. Hey, everybody. I'm Corey Chirko. I play with Shania Twain. And in the past, I played with Kelly Clarkson and Reba McIntyre. And I've been on the Line 6 team for many years, starting with the original pod. And currently, I use the, uh, the Helix... Um, I use it with a Kemper in the effects loop of the Kemper, and I use it as the controller, the MIDI controller for the Kemper as well. Um, everything, all the patch changes I get are from an external computer, so I never actually have to physically touch any of the buttons unless the computer crashes, which is never, right? <laughs> so um, that's currently how I use it. Um, next to you. I'm Richie Castellano. I play with Blue Oyster Cult, and I have a show on YouTube called Band Geek. And I use the Helix uh, direct into the PA system or the interface, uh, usually some pedals in the loop. And um, that's pretty much it. it. I've been using Line 6 gear since the HD 500, and uh, it's totally changed the way I do everything. You also use Variax, I understand. I do, I yeah. do. I use uh, Variax at, in the studio and on the road uh, to do everything from get acoustic tones, alternate tunings, different types of guitars. Like I said, total game changer for me. Uh, my name is Dustin Kensrew. Uh, I sing and play guitar in a band called Thrice. And I've been using uh, Helix for a while now. I've been using Line 6 stuff uh, in various forms and levels for uh, a long time. But uh, Helix is, I've always had something I was trying to get that I couldn't get in Helix is the first time where I'm just not looking back and super, super pleased with them just running the amps and all the effects in there. Uh, and yeah, using the effects loops to pull in some other stuff too. Sweet. And my name is Stevik McKay. I play in a band called 12 Foot Ninja. I use Helix uh, for everything. But we're going to talk more about these guys because they're more interesting. So what I want to know is how you guys uh, run it. We sort of touched on it a little bit, but when we were chatting before, everyone's kind of using Helix in a, in a bit of a different way. So, um, Corey, you were saying that you run it through the effects loop of the Kemper. Can you talk about that? Sure. Well, I have to say that if I do know the sound man and he's got enough inputs to the board, I'll give him three inputs. One will be the Kemper mono, kind of dry. Maybe I'll put a little bit of effects. The other two will be stereo helix. And I'll dial up the same kind of sound on the helix, but I'll completely make it 100% wet. So then... The sound man can pan my mono signal anywhere he wants while leaving the stereo um, sends alone, and I get a completely left-right signal, even though, because you know when you get in a, in a band with two guitar players, the sound man will pan, pan one guy to the left, one guy to the right, or off you know, center a little ways, and your stereo spectrum now is becoming more and more mono the more he pans you over. So this allows you to keep your stereo spread while making the sound man happy by letting your mono signal get panned anywhere. Do you, do you find that uh, most sound people are unhappy? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's absolutely. In fact, I know a lot of sound men, and they usually go by the name Dark Cloud. Yeah, right. Except Christine. She's not a man. She's awesome. So uh, that sounds pretty awesome, by the way. Um, I'm thinking in my head, how can I steal um, from you more? Um, what are you doing, man? Well, uh, with Blue Oyster Cult, we fly out to the gigs uh, and we bring just guitars and pedals and use rented backline. And uh, I was doing that for a while using uh, dual rectifiers, and you know, which are great amps. But after a while, you run into consistency problems where, okay, this one's broken, this one sounds way too bright, and so on and so forth. So I said, I, this is crazy. And then we started doing those big metal festivals in Europe where it's uh, grab it and go. Uh, no sound check. Basically, your sound check is while the other band is on stage B, like raging, you can't hear anything, and you're setting up on stage A, literally 50 feet next to them. And for and I'm watching other people who are using traditional rigs, and they're suffering because they can't hear anything. So um, for me, what the way I do it is I'm going from the quarter inch outs into a DI, 
uh, mono because we have a, we're a three guitar band. And um, our lead guitar player, Buck Dharma, has a very wide stereo image. Uh, with He uses the wet, dry, wet system. So I'm trying to sort of fit in the little cracks where he's not and just give some support. That's 95% uh, of the gig for me. Um, so that's my job is to be supportive. And I give the sound engineer the mono signal, mono out from the quarter inch, and I'm trying to keep that consistent. I don't mess with it because I know they have their own files that they save for the various... Uh, mixing consoles, and then we get a rented wedge or rented powered speaker, whether it's like a QSC or whatever the, the uh, local company has, and I go um, XLR out into that, and I use the global EQ inside the Helix just for that speaker because the variation in those powered wedges, they're so different. They sound like night and day. So that global EQ is really handy for me because I can quickly dial in the sound for the stage and usually it's just as simple as using the low and high cut because you know you'll plug into a certain speaker and it just sounds like Poof, you know so if i can just get rid of that i'm ready to go and it's it's pretty it's pretty fun to be able to just walk into a sound check and be done in like you know a minute it's it's awesome so and, that's, and i also have a um digitech freak out uh this is on on the road i have a digitech freak out in loop one and because uh, we try to keep our stage volume down, everybody's on in-ear monitors. Uh, so one thing I did lose is the ability to just like, you know, hold out that long note at the end of a song like a jerk. But uh, so the freak, the, the freak out gives me that back and I have that on a loop and just, you know, kick the pedal on when I want the long screaming note at the end of the tune. So have you got the freak out set, like where in the chain? Okay, I have a parallel path. Um, so the, the freak out just gets added on top. And um, when I, the freak out's a little noisy too, even when it's off. So what I do is I, um, I have a gate in front of it. So I turn off all the gating when I want the feedback to happen. So it, it works really well. Awesome, awesome. How about you, man? Uh, so I'm using it, uh, yeah, for all effects, uh, amps. I'm running, part of what I'm doing that makes it really helpful is I have a custom uh, Ernie Ball Stingray that has a mode where it's sending out uh, each pickup. Uh, so it's sending out stereo, so each pickup is on a separate line that goes into separate inputs into the Helix. Uh, and then I'm able to control using uh, snapshots, which I'll talk about in a second. But whatever part of the song I'm on, I can tell it, hey, I want the bridge pickup or the neck pickup or any blend of those that I want. Uh, so I've got that going in. Uh, and then I'm running through like a kind of Fendery amp on there, splitting to two different cabs um, to get just some different tones coming out. And then I'm running that direct uh, out. But the snapshots are my favorite thing about uh, Helix, really, because I'll have a different preset for each song in our set, and I'll build a set list. And so on that song, I know, hey, this is like the bridge part. This is the intro. Uh, and so when I'm singing, I don't need to worry about kind of playing pedal dance. I can just hit one button and it's uh, instantaneous. There's no gap or delay. So. Yeah, we were chatting. Did, did anyone know snapshots, the feature snapshots with Helix? Some people nodding. Maybe, maybe do you want to give your explanation of how, how it works? Yeah, so I mean, basically it's setting it up instead of like stomp boxes where you're hitting individual... Um, pedals you're setting up when i hit this button i want uh the delay over here to turn on and i want this delay that was already on i want to have uh the mix turn up on that to 42 degrees and i want uh you know i, I want to add in this other pedal and i want to i mean basically any of the parameters in there you can change just by hitting one button. Um, so if you are like me and you're very specific about what you want at any given time, uh, there's almost nothing that I've been able to think of and throw at the Helix that uh, isn't, you're not able to do. And with the, the interface on the Helix, it's very, very easy to do to where I'm uh, rarely getting up to mess with my computer because it's, it's easier to do even on the floor with the... the if buttons. I could interject for a second. One of the things I find best about the snapshots is that in any FX processor, when you go from one preset to the next, there's a small micro glitch where the sound drops out, you know, till the, the digital processing kicks in. With snapshots, 
you don't get any of that. It's sort of all loaded into DSP ahead of time. So when you're making those snapshot changes, there's no dropouts at all. Yeah, I think uh, a really, uh, to, to add to snapshots, if anyone's still not quite sure what they are, most people are used to loading a preset. Um, they load a bank of usually four presets. Um, and each time they hit a different preset, think about it like a virtual room. Each preset is a room. You have to put gear in that you're going to use for that preset. And then if you load another preset, you've got to take the gear out and then load new gear in. Um, and that's what causes the, the slight latency that uh, Corey was talking about. Whereas snapshots, it's like you've got all the gear in the room that you're going to use just in different states. And you take a picture of that state, you turn that thing off, you turn that thing on, change that parameter, take a picture, and you can instantly recall those pictures. So it's it's been a pretty awesome addition. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's so much that you can do with it that if you're just kind of creative, so I'll do stuff where I'm going to have a transition, and so I've got a delay on here, but I want a smooth transition, so I'll hit the, the next snapshot, but when it goes to that snapshot, it turned that delay off, but since it was already running, uh, I can turn up the mix even on it so that it will kind of send that delay hanging over the next uh, transition. Uh, there's uh, lots of stuff you can do. Yeah, that's killer. So you, uh, and you're running it completely different. You're, you've got a different setup. You were saying you've got sort of uh, presets on the bottom and, and stomp boxes on the top. Yeah, I use um, two banks to do almost everything. I have um, bank one is for the standard guitar. And uh, that has like a, it goes from clean to dirtier. You know, like clean, a little gritty, crunch, uh, total kill. And um, so those are on the bottom, those are the presets. And within each one of those presets, I have four effects that I can turn on and off, uh, which is usually like a drive, uh, some sort of modulation, maybe uh, the feedback pedal will be on a loop and then a, uh, a boost. And then I'll have the, the delay uh, mix on the expression pedal. That's one bank. The second bank, is dedicated to the Variax, and uh, that I'm doing some really interesting things with, with that. Um, you know, I have an acoustic guitar on one. I have uh, my rhythm guitar, which is like a Les Paul from the Variax, into a Marshall. And then uh, when I hit one button, it actually tunes my Variax. It turns the uh, tunes the low E string down to a drop D. Uh, gives me like a tube screamer and a little bit of a mid scoop to get more of the uh, heavy rhythm tone. And um, it's amazing that I can do that without having to switch a guitar. You know, that I'm getting three different guitars just by tapping. It's, it's amazing to me that I can even do that. And a lot of people say, you know, oh, I'm thinking about the Variax, but, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's going to uh, compare to my Les Paul or my Stratus. It, it's, it's not about that. It's about that you can't do this with your Les Paul and your Stratus. You can't, you know, from one beat to the next, put down the Les Paul and pick up your Strat. It's impossible. So this is... Um, a problem solver, uh, and, and it solves a problem that people just didn't even think that, it, it wasn't even a problem because you wouldn't even try to do things like this because you didn't think it was possible. But, you know, I can get totally far out with the, with the Variax, and especially now that you can plug one, uh, the VDI cable from the Helix into the Variax, it powers it, and you have total control over every parameter in the Variax from the Helix. So programming patches is amazing. Because you can do whatever you want. And even uh, back to what you were saying about the pickup changes, you can do that too. Like if you don't have time to switch a pickup change, you just program it in the pedal. It's awesome. Do you guys find that you program all of that crazy stuff, different things that you're doing? Do you use it? Do you do it on board or do you use the H? You said you, the HX edit is something that you, you're kind of into. Uh, yeah, the new, the new interface on the computer is great with HX edit, but. Uh, it's honestly easier to use the pedal, which is really rare, um, especially with the, what do we call it, the capacitive touch. So you can just be like, oh, I want to switch these two, hold them down, hit the button. Actually, that's a, that's a corker feature. Corker, is that a word that is no. used in, that means good. Um, <laughs> so yeah, maybe talk about that, that, that weird touch sensitive thing. It's like it uh, picks up what you're thinking. Yeah, so you can... Uh, if you touch the pedals with your hand, uh, it can tell that you're touching it. Uh, not pressing it, but just touching it. So if I wanted to switch uh, where two of my snapshots or stomps were, I can just touch both of them, and it will bring up, it'll sense it, it'll say, hey, do you want to switch these? Say yes. Or I can touch one and then the other, and it says, oh, you want to copy that one over there? Yes. Uh, it's kind helpful. of like having the force, isn't it? 
Wow. <laughs> exactly. I mean, w- one thing that I, I've never been able to do with another unit is, uh, for example, um, all of us who who use preset-based digital gear, so you're playing a gig and you go, ah, oh, you know, the the feedback on this delay is just not enough. I don't hear enough taps. And then, you, then what you used to have to do is make a mental note, and then hope that you remembered once the gig was over to either you know teletech or, or or okay, let me program that. But that never happens. And then the second night of the tour happens, and you go, oh, I didn't do that again. And then it just and then you never get the sound. What I, what I do frequently with this is if when that happens, I go into the uh, mode. I hold down the mode switch, and all the parameters are foot controllable. So I'm I'm making preset changes on the fly in the middle of a gig during a song it's it's amazing and and i don't none of the other pieces of gear i've ever owned can do that you actually do it i do it i i, I try to look like i'm still like moving around and stuff but I, you know, i'm like <laughs> i do that sort of thing but uh you know i i actually do it in the middle of a gig yeah wow yeah I i've think- always wondered i was like i'd I'm not doing that. But. <laughs> yeah, that, that's hardcore. But I think that the the thing that the subtext with all that is this: the helix um, is very intuitive. Like, you know, I, I found it uh, incredibly easy to use compared to some of, some other products on the market that you you have to um, get a degree from NASA to actually work out how to program well, it. I mean, even compared to the the last HD stuff, it's it's night and yeah. day. Yeah, totally. What I wanted to know was uh, how many trips from the car. Is it for you guys to take your gear on stage? Well, that is the fantastic thing about it. In fact, I have a, a cool backpack for this Helix that I stick on my back and I walk through the gate. I get on the plane with it and uh, it's so much smaller. I had to bring an amp for another booth here at NAM so that they could use to demo their guitar. And I'm like, now I remember why I don't use amps anymore. Uh, something else I would say is uh, the amp modeling in this generation is phenomenal, but also uh, the stomp box kind of uh, like dirt pedals took a huge leap uh, in this generation uh, to where I had a hard time using um, the dirt boxes on, on uh, the pro stuff, but I, on this, they, they sound phenomenal. So there's the... The Minotaur, which is like a clown centaur that I have on all the time, and I'm basically using that, going into kind of a cleaner amp, and using that to control gain, and uh, even, a, it's just three knobs, so it's gain, level, and uh, tone, and I'm kind of EQing with that and doing level, and uh, it's super helpful. Yeah, What's, yeah maybe, uh, do you guys have any favorite go-tos? So you like the Minotaur? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that's your thing? What? Uh, I I use mostly the uh, Angle uh, Meteor. That's ninety percent of what I'm doing. Um, I also really love the uh, Matchstick. Uh, that's a, that's a big one for me. And um, the the Litigator. I know everybody loves the Litigator. That's that's an that's an awesome one. Um, and the uh, the transistor delay and the Vintage Digital. I use those a lot too. I love the Wow and Flutter uh, features on. I think it's the Tube Delay. And the tape delay, and uh, and I also use the the tile reverb a lot to give an ambience to the sound. You know, part of Malcolm's guitar sound and Angus's guitar sound. When you listen to Back in Black or whatever, it's not as much the guitar sound as it is the whole energy of the room and the miking that goes on in that. It makes it just seem so much bigger. And I find that that tile uh, it really helps. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of the Obsidian. 7,000, I turn the distortion off and just use it as a, like a grunt, kind of like a growl kind of sound before the ant model is pretty kick-ass. Anyway, I think we're time for questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, you guys go down the line and talk about your uh, Yeah, I haven't messed around with the IRs uh, a ton, um, but I really like that I'm able to split out too. So I'm running through like a kind of fendery clean sound, boosting it from the front, but then splitting into, I think like a closed back kind of Mesa Boogie uh, cab and then a just like a normal open back uh, fender style. So it gives uh, the sound guy a lot to work with there when he needs to boost certain things. Also. Uh, our sound guy is super grumpy, as you could imagine, but he 
<laughs> when I brought the Helix on, I, I like th- he should hate it, and he's had only begrudgingly nice things to say about it. So, yeah, that's the usual. I've I worked pretty closely with our sound guy um, when building the the presets, um, and my, I don't want to drive him crazy because he has his hands full with three guitars, keyboards, and everybody sings. Uh, so what I the approach I took is I use basically one IR for that whole gig, um, and I run all the amps through that one IR. It's an Ownhammer uh, 412 closed back Mesa. Uh, with I think it. that's the one I use. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, so it sounds awesome. And uh, just because it, even though I'm getting different tones, it doesn't totally throw off his EQ his EQ curves every time I change presets. So that's what I'm trying to do is just give him what he needs, and uh, and and we talk a lot about it. And another really powerful uh, feature and uh, something I use inside the Helix lot that I forgot to mention is the parametric EQ. I mean, to me, that's like so powerful, and it's probably the most powerful um, effect in there because you can really get into the details of sculpting what you want the, the sound to do and how you want it to resonate and that's just, how we do it just on that real quick so when you're sculpting your sounds uh, are you uh, and this is a loaded question because this is something I find I say a lot to Helix people are you conscious of the output source when you're creating your sound so you're not running through you know some like $10 computer speakers when you do it I, I am conscious and that's why I I have feedback from the engineer, like during a sound check. When I, especially when I first got the Helix, I would say, "Okay, what do you need more of? What do you need less of?" And he'd be saying, "Okay, you're sort of taking my head off in the 4K range. Can you?" And I mean, he can do that, but the thing is, if I do it, then he has so much more room, and, to, and so that's that's how I'm doing it. Yeah. Well, look, uh, we had a panel with Billy Sheehan, and he was saying the same thing. When he's building his tones, he's conscious of doing it in the environment that he's going to be using the tones, yeah. and that's gonna, yeah. Well, that's why it's really awesome that you have the flexibility to assign the global EQ to whatever output you want. Because I can, once I've set those EQs for the front of house guy, I, c- I have my own global that I can play with for the uh, stage monitor. So that's why I do it that way. Uh, I think the sooner that you get into IRs, the better with Helix. Uh, I spent a whole day ABing um, a few IRs, uh, the Ownhammer ones and the Celestian ones. And... I was with a friend, and we both agreed that the Celestian were making things dramatically better. So you can check that out. I also, on, just really quickly on the IR thing, these guys are some pretty impressive uh, studio people and awesome producers and engineers. When I got the IRs, I couldn't tell whether, I was, you know, like when you go to a restaurant and the sommelier comes out and says, this tomato was sucked on by a leopard aged <laughs> in a barrel from the mount you know, freaking whatever, and you go, wow, this tomato tastes amazing. I couldn't tell whether I was experiencing that with the IRs and I just settled on one that happened to be probably the exact same one there. So maybe my ears were right, but I think ultimately, and, and Corey's like a gun at doing the profiling stuff, um, but for me, um, I think you can trust your ears, whatever, whatever works. Like I know some people that like a, a sound like it's been chewed on by a dog, you know, and other people want this... Qu- you know, super clean sort of sound. So it's uh, probably not a one shoe f- fits all scenario. So I don't know. Summary, I reckon. I mean, I, I think the cabs already sound great, but it's cool that there's the options for the IR stuff um, if you want to dig into the weeds. And um, the other thing I was going to say is I build my sounds at my house with studio speakers, saying, like, this is the sound I want. Um, and so when I'm going out of a a cab on stage or something. I, I'm not as worried about that. I have in-ears in, but I just need some, some feedback there. But I like being able to dial it in in an environment where I can tell this is exactly how I want the guitar to sound and we're about to record a record and I'm going to use the Helix for all of my stuff, which is great because I'm getting the sound like directly. Like This is what I want to sound, not like, well, the amp sounds like this, but what what do I have to use to get it back into the computer to sound like that? Yeah, so. yeah totally. But yeah, I'm, I want to, I mean, we were talking before, I'm going to steal some ideas off Corey because he's, he's into that profiling stuff flat out. Um, any other, have we got time for more questions? So I'm running directly into uh, just like the, the PA, but then I also am running, uh, I have, right now I'm using the, what is it called? The, the oh, wow. flat... Yeah, the f- I'm using the Firehawk for stage volume. Um, so. 
Uh, when I'm home, I use the um, L2 speaker. Uh, but like I said before, on the road, when it's an uh, unpredictable backline, we just ask for any 12-inch powered monitor. Yeah, I use the big, the bigger version of this. What is it? L3, I think. Yeah. Uh, so it's like twice the size of this. And it, it's a really good idea to do that because a lot of the problem with these sort of devices is that you don't get the sustain because you don't get that feedback from your speaker. Um, so it's important. You can run it direct to the PA system, but it's nice to have this facing up at you and your pickup so that you don't have to dial in so much gain just to get some sustain. Then your, your sound isn't so hissy in the end. Yeah, I, especially, uh, I, like I have the Firehawk right in front of me too, pointing up, nice. and uh, one of the backstage too, but uh, it's way better than trying to figure out uh, the EQ of whatever, uh, I mean, you're dealing with that in your own way, but exactly. you know, just having the monitors like, be like, hey, can you put some in there, and it's going to be completely different. Yeah, I don't, even, I don't even hear it because I have in-ears in, but I can just feel it, and, and it just feels so much better. You don't have to work so hard. Yeah, I'm using direct-to-PA in-ear monitors, um, so I don't have anything apart from what's in my head. And there was one time we had a front-of-house dude that used to do this funny little thing where he would drink the rider before he mixed us, and he forgot to turn my guitars on front-of-house. So I was just rocking out, and there was no guitar for, like, the first three songs. So, yeah, after that, I was thinking maybe I need to get something on stage. But, yeah, I, I invested... Or a new sound guy. Yeah, well, he, he's gone now. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I, the in-ears, I, I invest in some, some decent in-ears because the output source is super important with any kind of modelling device. Um, and I've got to stress it. I, m I mentioned it before because people are like, ah, oh, it sounds crap. And I'm like, what are you plugging it into? And then, you know, you find out what they're plugging into and you're like, well, you, it's like you're... You're running a preamp and power amp modeler into something that also has a preamp and a power amp. So it's like I'm going to have a sandwich and the, the middle is going to be bread. Like it just doesn't work. So transparent, direct, that's the way to go because these are, these are killer. They sound awesome. I try to uh, have no stage monitor because I, I always saw like the big the big tours you never see speakers anywhere so I'm like oh that's pretty cool let me try that and I and, and I play in a rock and roll band so uh, the first time I did that the other guys were like you need some some stage volume and I was like no it's so cool I'm going direct it's like no 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 it's it's throwing everybody off you need some stage volume so that's when I, saw, I said okay I'll get the uh, whatever uh, powered speaker the backline company has it's good to have options too because some shows the front of house is in front of the front of the crowd so those people pressed up against the stage barrier just hearing the drums like when everyone's direct so that can be a, a thing to be conscious of i mean if it's a really good room they think about that stuff but um having some on stage sound is usually pretty good we good for more questions anyone else got a question so he's asking uh if we use the microphone inputs as well uh, for singing. Uh, I haven't. Uh, I do some solo kind of acoustic stuff, and I've thought about taking it with me and running the guitar and the vocals through there just so I have some control over, you know, maybe some reverb or different things going on. Uh, but I have not done that yet. Uh, I am thinking about incorporating using some synth stuff on the iPad directly through the USB. Uh, which I've experimented with, uh, which gives you another input, which is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I did mess around with it. I have a video on YouTube where I actually run uh, guitar, backing tracks, and vocal through this uh, and have it set up so you can use this as like an in-ear monitoring mixer. Um, and so you could check that out. But um, uh, with normal gigs, usually not because that would probably piss off the sound engineer if you're going through a piece of gear before he got you. So... Um, but I, I have played with it, and it sounds great. I have not done that at all, but I think you raise a good point, and that is there are so many possibilities with this unit. It really, you can just make it your bitch, really, whatever you want it to do. Uh, there's so many routing capabilities and DSP capabilities and so many internal jacks and external jacks. and Yeah, that's yeah, great. I, mean, I, I would say for someone who doesn't have a dedicated sound person, that could be a really, really valuable thing if you were singing and playing, and so you'd have, so if you set that up with snapshots, you could have each snapshot related to like, hey, I want my vocal to have this effect at this time, uh, and the sound guy's gonna have no control over that, so he's just setting a level, but you'd be able to control it yourself. 
Yeah. Um, one thing, you, you were saying that you use the Variax with an acoustic sound. Um, are you, and this is another loaded question, are you running your acoustic sound into like a, uh, like a rectified kind of amp model or? No, it's just a straight up acoustic. I, um, I'm, I just usually run it through the, uh, the mic preamp. Oh, that's then, weird. Yeah. Who would have thought to do that? <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing how many people say the acoustic sounds thin and then you look at their signal chain and they're plugged into like a stack. <laughs> you know, so the mic pre is, is um, the mic pre block, like the model. Right. Yeah. Yeah, then into EQ, compression, some reverb. I mean, I, I have a good, res I get good results from the Variax, but the thing that um, I find is really helpful is if you pull up an acoustic sound, don't play it like you're playing a Telecaster. Play it like you're playing an acoustic. Like, change your brain a little bit to uh, to adjust for that. Because if you don't, it's going to sound like you're still playing electric guitar. So that's, that's an awesome point. Yeah, you you have to accommodate the instrument that you're replicating. Don't use all kinds of vibrato that gives it away. E exactly. Um, uh, Buck from my band. The first time I, I brought the acoustic model on stage, at the end of the song, I used the uh, the tremolo arm, and he was like, "You just ruined it." He said, "Because you, you had the whole the whole illusion was going, and you just ruined it." So it's it's a good it's a good point. And someone watched me play the acoustic and said, "You're playing the thing like it's a big jumbo, like you're actually bringing your arm out." I said, "That's just it gets me in the mindset to do it." And do you put a headband on and write like things on your guitar, I like do. political yeah. messages and stuff? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Peace signs. <laughs> Have you guys actually, uh, have you opened another portal yet with your presets at all? Like another dimension or anything like that? Uh, well, I I sort of had like that experience with using native uh, because, you know, um, we, we're all recording guys and, you know, I it was cool being able to plug this into, say, Pro Tools and record it. But then when, when, they, when they released native, being able to put it on a track and have my whole workflow from that, that was sort of like, an out-of-body experience, like a weird uh, head trip. <laughs> how, how do you compare Native, uh, the plug-in, uh, which is, if anyone doesn't know, Native is like the Helix in a plug-in form. How do you compare that to the, the hardware? I mean, I to me, just the idea that I can bring all the presets I use on the road into Pro Tools, that's a win. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it sounds close to, close to me. It sounds identical to me, actually. And, um, you know, the, the fact that you know, I used to say, okay, well, I have this piece of hardware, but let me uh, rely on uh, whatever I can find in terms of plugins if, in case I want to, like, reamp something or... So you know. how, how much do you guys do the reamping thing uh, and how valuable is it to do that in your mixes? I, I do it all the time, uh, especially when, like I said, I have that show Band Geek and we do songs with the band in the studio and I don't want to go nuts. We, we have to do it fast, so I um, pick a, a regular guitar sound, whatever it is, uh, DI it, uh, through the uh, Helix rack, and then I can really work on getting the tone I want afterwards, which is a big time saver for me. Maybe just in case anyone doesn't know what reamping is, could you summarize it really quickly? Well, reamping is when you record or in a recording session, and you want to be able to change the the sound of the amp later. You don't want to commit to one certain sound, so you record direct. Uh, uh, as well as recording an app usually, and then you can change it later if you find it's sitting in the mix, it's not poking out right, you have endless possibilities. But the problem I have is that I tweak way too much and I never get any work done. So I did that for a while until I found out what works, and, and now I just kind of commit. Yep. Cool. Any other questions? Well, for example, if you have, say, a guitar like uh, the, mu the Music Man Petrucci that has a piezo in it, uh, what you can actually do is you can plug the uh, magnetics and the piezo in there and use the expression pedal to blend between them. And, that, and that's like an inverted value. As one goes up, one goes down. Um, also, with the um, in-ear monitor video I did, uh, you can control the, le the balance between your voice and your guitar from the pedal. So basically... Anything you can imagine, you can do on this. And I you know, find myself waking up in the middle of the night saying, ah, and I, I'll go down and uh, you know, tweak something. 
Uh, there's another really awesome thing you can do is when uh, you bring the expression pedal down, you can have it bypass certain effects. So here's like a good example. I was doing a cover of, you know, White Room uh, Cream. Uh, and so you're singing, you know, in a white room, and you want just the regular uh, uh, rhythm guitar sound. But then when you play that wah, you want it to poke up a little bit. So I had it, when I had the pedal all the way down, uh, the wah was bypassed, and I had a boost that was bypassed. And when I brought the pedal up, that turned the boost and the wah on, and that was like self-mixing, you know? Yeah, I, I do some similar stuff. And you can set that threshold anywhere you want. So I'll do somewhere... I've got something turning on at like 95, almost all the way up. And so there's actually a fair amount of songs where I use uh, the expression pedal more than I really even step on any pedals. And I'll just, I'll have like, hey, when I'm here, this is happening. But when I go up here, it's, it's boosting this, it's turning this thing on, it's turning this thing down. Um, so depending on the kind of transition that you want, um, it can be a lot smoother because you're you're actually ramping the things yeah. in and out. Yeah, it is quite a smooth. You can get that like there's no d -d 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 stepwise stuff. It's like very smooth. I, I've used it. I turned the delay time. I changed the delay time and I pitched down. So I, the pitch goes backwards and the delay time goes forwards. And I actually go into the future temporarily and come back. Yeah, but I do that because we play a little dub dubby sort of stuff, which is. I might be getting this totally wrong, but it's kind of like reggae with heaps of effects over the top. So I mix that stuff in myself and then put trails on, so I'll turn it off and I'll have that still going while I'm skanking underneath. So I love, yeah, it's, I use it like a, the, the, the evil, crazy weapon sort of parameter control. You're using it in a very smart, awesome way. <laughs> so I think we might be out of time. Thank you for hanging out, watching. Thanks to these guys and uh, bloody good on ya. See you later. <laughs>